The Flip Side, Disc 4 The Science of Modeling Identifying some of the strategies optimists use is absolutely crucial if we are to learn how to become more optimistic ourselves and to find the flip side in our own lives. If we can understand their beliefs and learn their behaviours, or as neuro-linguistic programming, NLP practitioners say, model them, then we should start to experience the same results. Modelling is a technique that is commonly used in NLP. It is a system designed to replicate the results achieved by other people in any area of life. Essentially, it is a form of accelerated learning that is achieved by adopting someone else's behaviours and mimicking their beliefs. Obviously, allowance has to be made for any physical or physiological differences. A man who is two feet smaller than Michael Jordan would not be able to replicate Jordan's play on a basketball court. Similarly, a woman who suffers from diabetes wouldn't be able to expect the same improvement in her health by copying the exercise and dietary regimes of a woman with a healthy pancreas. But subject to known physical and physiological differences, copying other people's beliefs and actions should produce the same or similar results that they achieve in their lives. NLP guru and best-selling author Tony Robbins has proved the efficacy of modelling in a number of different settings. In one interview with CNN, he cited a situation where he challenged the US Army to give him any training programme and he would cut the training time in half and at the same time increase the competency of soldiers who went through the programme. The US Army accepted the challenge and gave Robbins the task of improving their pistol-shooting training course. The Army had developed its own four-day programme and according to its own records, 70% of soldiers passed the final competency test. If Robbins could cut the training time to two days and increase the competency levels of the soldiers above 70%, he would be paid. Anything less, and he would get nothing. Robbins knew nothing whatsoever about pistol shooting. In fact, prior to this challenge, he had never picked up a gun. But his lack of knowledge and experience were irrelevant. He would learn all that he needed to know by interviewing the best pistol shooters in the army. I got the best shooters in the world, and I had them come and fire, and I'd stop them at each step, he explained. What are you doing in your mind? What are you doing physically? And I saw what they did in common. They didn't even realize what they were doing. Then Robbins compared their behaviours with soldiers who were poor shots. The differences were obvious, he said. Success leaves clues. Robbins then developed a pistol shooting course which was based upon the critical beliefs and behaviours of the best pistol shooters rather than standard textbook instruction. His course took just one day to complete and for the first time in the history of pistol shooting training in the army, every soldier who went through the programme passed the competency test. It was a massive improvement from the Army's original course. Modelling can be used for anything we need to learn and is one of the key components of NLP. It has been successfully used to help people achieve better results in sport, in business and in personal relationships. By modelling people who are extreme optimists, the naturally pessimistic person can quickly learn to become more optimistic themselves and achieve much the same results in their lives. If we identify optimists' thought processes and behaviours, elicit their strategies, and notice how they respond in times of difficulty, we can gain an insight into exactly what it is that enables people to find the flip side. Suzanne Segerstrom is an associate professor in the psychology department at the University of Kentucky and a highly respected researcher in this field. She also believes that optimism is a highly malleable characteristic. In a 10-year study, Segerstrom demonstrated that optimism is influenced by changes in our resources as well as our experiences. She also contends that these changes can and do occur through adulthood. For example, in one study focusing on women, it was found 
that as problems at work and with their spouses increased, the women's optimism decreased. Furthermore, Dr. Segerstrom stated that there is evidence demonstrating that our states of optimism can change over fairly short periods of time, weeks to months. She also confirms that change in a person's optimism is closely related to change in their mental and physical health. Optimists are both psychologically and physiologically healthier, she says. Clearly, there are very good reasons for trying to consciously work towards becoming more optimistic. In her book, Breaking Murphy's Law, Dr. Segerstrom provides alternative suggestions to encourage optimism other than through CBT. She contends that if we focus on our actions, literally follow in the footsteps of optimistic people by acting optimistically and positively, our thoughts and beliefs will follow. This supports the NLP technique of modelling. For example, according to NLP theory, people who feel depressed adopt a specific physiology and posture. Their back slumps, their shoulders drop, their head looks down, their breathing becomes shallow, and they talk in a tired, monotone voice. Conversely, sitting or standing upright, with head held high, shoulders back and breathing deeply, makes it very difficult to feel depressed. The physiology and posture of the body influences our thoughts and emotions. What NLP practitioners and Dr. Segerstrom are saying is that when we act as if we are optimistic, for example, by looking for benefits and opportunities and persisting even after repeated failure, we will tend to experience the same results as optimists and then we will start to feel optimistic. Feeding the Optimist Within A Native American Indian once described his inner struggle. He said that he felt as if there were two dogs inside him, one a pessimist and the other an optimist. The pessimist is always fighting the optimist, he said. When asked which dog wins, he thought for a moment and then replied, the one I decide to feed. Peter Schulman, research manager at the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Psychology, understands more than most the challenges of staying optimistic. Even the die-hard optimist will occasionally have pessimistic beliefs when exposed to extreme or prolonged stress, he says. It seems we all have a pessimist and an optimist inside us and which one comes through on any given day, will be the one we decide to feed. Twenty healthy men and women, whose average age is 33, are watching the opening scene in the film Saving Private Ryan. It is an intense, very stressful 24 minutes, following a group of soldiers on the morning of the 6th of June 1944, in what became known as the Normandy Landings. In the largest invasion made on a single day ever witnessed in any war, 130,000 Allied troops stormed the Normandy beaches in the face of hostile enemy artillery. The opening scene of the film is notable for the way in which it involves the audience in its realism. The way it depicts the graphic horrors of war is compelling, but at times very difficult to watch. What the audience is unaware of is that while they are watching, Biochemical and hormonal changes are taking place in all of them. Even those members of the audience who had seen the film before are affected. Average blood flow through their veins and arteries is restricted by as much as 35%. 48 hours later, the same audience is shown a 15-minute segment of Kingpin, a light-hearted comedy film. This time, blood flow is improved by 22%. Endorphins are released, and the aerobic activity caused by laughing is found to be very similar to the benefits experienced when doing physical exercise. Further confirmation that Norman Cousins had come across a huge medical breakthrough when he noticed that laughter relieved his pain. The biochemical changes that take place in the film audiences show how easily our bodies are influenced by what is going on around us. Professor Dan Ariely 
has shown in his work at Duke University that our thoughts and expectations are even affected by what we read. He found, for example, that by adding specific emotive words to a word search task given to a group of students, he could influence the thoughts and actions of the students. One group of students were given word search tasks that included the words aggressive, rude, annoying and intrude. And another group were given a task involving words such as considerate, polite and sensitive. The students were then told to go to another room and report to a clinician. When they arrived, the clinician, who was a confederate of the researchers, was engaged in a conversation with an associate. The students who had been primed with the polite words waited, on average, 9.3 minutes before they finally interrupted the clinician, whereas the students who had been primed with the aggressive words waited just 5.5 minutes before they butted in. Similar studies showed the same results. Words included in a questionnaire that conveyed the concept of being elderly or old actually affected the students' physical demeanour. Students who are given questionnaires that included words associated with the elderly such as Florida, Bingo and Ancient would amble out of the test room and down the corridor at a walking speed that resembled an elderly, frail person considerably slower than the control group of students. My favourite of Professor Ariely's experiments in this field was that related to honesty. Students were asked to write down the Ten Commandments prior to taking a simple maths test and then given an opportunity to cheat by self-marking their test. It turned out that just reminding the students of the Ten Commandments had a demonstrable effect on their behaviour. Their behaviour was significantly more honest than that of a control group. What Professor Ariely brilliantly demonstrates in his experiments is how easily influenced we all are by the things that go on around us. His work shows that often our decisions and actions are completely irrational and that they are rarely the results of conscious logic and sound reasoning, but at the same time they are very predictable. However, what Ariely also teaches is that by understanding how our thoughts and feelings are impacted by the things that we see and hear, we can begin to use these manifestations to our advantage. In much the same way that Norman Cousins boosted his immune system, improved blood flow and controlled his pain by watching funny videos, by being more discerning about what we watch on TV, what we read and who we associate with, we can start to influence our thoughts and feelings. If we can create stress through a film and affect honesty, politeness and the feeling of strength and power simply through words, then surely we can use the same methods to raise our expectations and learn to become more optimistic. We have seen that optimism is a vital component in overcoming any difficulty or setback. Optimists win hands down in virtually every aspect of life. But feelings of optimism can be changed, and there are a variety of ways through which we can learn to become more optimistic. CBT, modelling, acting as if we were optimistic, and controlling our environment, and in particular, what we feed our minds, are just a few examples of ways through which we can escape pessimism and learn to expect and experience a brighter future. This is the first step on the pathway to the flip side. Chapter 9 The Entrepreneur's Mindset Looking for Hidden Opportunities The entrepreneur in us sees opportunities everywhere we look. But many people see only problems. Michael Gerber Oklahoma, USA, 1936 Sylvan Goldman, part owner of the Humpty Dumpty supermarket chain, is working late in his office. He stares ahead looking at a chair, his mind focused on a problem. Like all businesses before and since, 
Goldman needs to increase sales. Supermarkets rely on volume, a rapid turnover of relatively low-priced items in order to maximize their profits. This can be achieved only by either increasing the number of customers that walk through the stores or by increasing the number of items sold to each customer. Goldman was focused on the latter option, which was where his problem lay. Goldman knew that his customers would buy more items from his stores and he was aware that they wanted to buy the more expensive, larger and heavier items. But his problem was this. There is only so much that a customer could physically carry in the wicker shopping baskets that the supermarkets provided. It was a problem shared by his competitors as well. And this was why Goldman stayed behind in his office working late into the evening. It was a problem he was determined to solve because he understood something that others didn't. This was an incredible opportunity. Goldman had been faced with problems before. In 1921, he and his brother lost their wholesale business when oil prices slumped. The two then considered the retailing business and moved to California to learn about new methods for retailing groceries. They recognized that the future of the grocery business held great promise. Goldman noted, The wonderful thing about food is that everyone uses it, and uses it only once. In many ways, it is the perfect business. Everyone has to eat, and consumable products require ongoing repeat sales. The two brothers came back from California enthused and set up a chain of self-service grocery stores. Within a few years, they sold out to Safeway, but their success was short-lived. The lion's share of their payout came in the form of shares in Safeway, the value of which was completely wiped out during the Great Depression that hit America in October 1929. Over $10 billion was wiped out on the New York Stock Exchange. A lot of people, including Goldman, lost everything. But, while others sunk into a personal depression or threw themselves out of windows, Sylvan Goldman would not be beaten because he understood that even in crisis, there would be a flip side. Being wiped out financially and with their only asset being their expertise, the Goldman brothers went back to work in the grocery business and by 1936, they'd acquired half of the Humpty Dumpty supermarket chain. More significantly, they were on the verge of uncovering an opportunity that would change their lives forever and cause a revolution in the supermarket industry. But just as Harlan Sanders had to lose everything in order to create the KFC empire, it is far from certain whether Sylvan Goldman would have re-entered the grocery business had he not been financially wiped out during the Great Depression. And had he not been in the grocery business, it is even more unlikely that he would have made the discovery that would become his greatest achievement. It began to dawn on Goldman, as he sat alone in his office late that evening in 1936, pondering over the problem that had been troubling him for some time, what could he do that would enable his customers to buy more than they could carry in a wicker basket? The answer came to him as he sat idly staring at a folding wooden chair. He ruminated over the possibility, put wheels on the legs, the shopping basket in the seat, changed the frame from wood to metal, and the concept of the shopping cart was born. Goldman worked on the idea with a friend, an engineer called Fred Young, and the following year, the two of them created the world's first shopping cart consisting of a metal frame that held two wire baskets. The frames were designed to be folded and the baskets stacked. Essentially, they were folding metal frames with handles and wheels. Customers could place handheld baskets on the carriers and take them off again at checkout. As the idea was inspired by a folding chair, Goldman called his carts folding basket carriers and formed the Folding Carrier Basket Company. Initially, customers didn't want to use the carts. Young men thought that the shopping carts made them look weak. Young women felt the carts were unfashionable, and older people 
were worried that the carts made them appear helpless. But Goldman had realised that his biggest problem was also his greatest opportunity. If he could overcome these image concerns, his shopping carts could revolutionise the retail industry. Changing customers' perceptions of the carts turned out to be relatively simple. Goldman hired models of all ages and both sexes to push shopping carts around the store, pretending that they were shopping. In addition, he had attractive store greeters at the entrance to every store, encouraging customers to use the shopping carts. These two strategies did the trick. The following year, Goldman and Young obtained a patent for their invention, and by the 1940s, the shopping cart was seen in supermarkets across America. In fact, most supermarkets were completely redesigned from the entrance through to the aisles, the checkout counters and exit, so as to accommodate the use of the shopping cart. Sylvan Goldman changed the face of supermarkets all over the world, and in doing so, turned both himself and Fred Young into millionaires. His success, like most successes, had come from a hidden opportunity contained within a problem. A different way of seeing. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. George Bernard Shaw. Sylvan Goldman's achievements were the result of a very specific mindset. It is a mindset shared by inventors and entrepreneurs who look upon problems not as obstacles, but as opportunities. All invention and innovation, as we shall see throughout this book, is the result of confronting a problem. This is why inventors and entrepreneurs welcome problems instead of trying to avoid them as people generally do. They become excited rather than frustrated by problems, because they know that every problem, no matter how big or small, contains an opportunity and the larger the problem that they encounter, the larger the opportunity that lies within it. Louis's problem was far more serious than Sylvan Goldman's. Louis was blind. The year was 1814, and Louis was just four years old. The previous year, an accident in his father's harness and saddle workshop cost him the sight in his left eye. But not long after... Sympathetic ophthalmia, a common phenomenon in which both eyes become inflamed following trauma to one, left Louis completely blind in both eyes. Louis was faced with the prospect of having to live in darkness for the rest of his life. At the age of ten, Louis was sent to study at the Royal Institute for Blind Youth in Paris, France. In the early 19th century, it was commonly accepted that blind people would never be able to read or write and so the Institute taught the students basic craftsman skills and simple trades. The school did teach the children to feel raised letters, a system devised by the school's founder, Valentin Ailly. But this was cumbersome and difficult. Louis believed that there had to be a better system and made it his goal to develop one. Louis was a bright and creative student and became a talented cellist and organist in his time at the Institute, playing the organ for churches all over France. But his main focus was his dream of developing a better system for blind people to read and write. From the age of twelve, he experimented with codes, using a knitting needle to punch holes in paper to represent letters, and by the age of fifteen, he had developed an ingenious system of sightless reading and writing by means of feeling raised dots. Two years later, he adapted his method to musical notation. Louis used a pattern of just six raised dots in varying combinations to represent letters, numbers, punctuation marks and mathematical symbols. He showed his method to his classmates who liked it and began using it, in spite of the fact that the governors of the institute had decided to ban it. By the time he reached 17 years of age, Louis graduated and became an assistant teacher at the Institute, and two years later he accepted a full-time teaching position there. 
yet he still had to teach his method secretly to the students. The first book, using Louis's system, was published in 1827 under the title Method of Writing Words, Music and Plain Songs by Means of Dots for Use by the Blind and Arranged for Them. After some slight modifications, by 1834 it reached a form that has remained to this day. It is a system which is commonly known by Louis' surname, Braille. In 1839, Louis Braille published full details of the method he had developed for communication with sighted people, using patterns of dots to approximate the shape of printed symbols. Together with his friend Pierre Foucault, Louis went on to develop a machine to speed up the somewhat cumbersome system. Louis died of tuberculosis in Paris in 1852, at just 43 years of age, he never received the accolades that he deserved during his lifetime. Although he was admired and respected by his students, his Braille system was never taught at the Institute during his lifetime, and when he died, not a single newspaper in all of Paris contained news of his death, let alone an obituary. However, six months after his death, the Royal Institute for Blind Youth officially adopted Louis' six-dot method, and by 1868, his raised six-dot system became the worldwide standard, helping the blind read books, clocks, wristwatches, thermometers, sheet music, and even elevator buttons. In 1952, on the centenary of his death, newspapers everywhere printed his story. His portrait appeared on postage stamps, and his home is now a museum. In his honour, the French government moved his remains to the Pantheon in Paris. There, Louis Braille was laid to rest with other great French heroes. Louis devoted his life in selfless service to his pupils, to his friends, but most of all, to the perfection of his raised dot method, which has enabled millions of blind people to read and write and achieve a better life. Today, Braille has been adapted to almost every major national language and is the primary system of written communication for visually impaired people around the world. The name of Braille will always remain associated with one of the greatest and most beneficent devices ever invented. And like all great inventions, it began with one person who had a problem. Correcting Errors A man's errors are his portals of discovery. James Joyce Bet Nesmith Graham had all of the problems one would expect of a single mother in the 1950s. To support herself and her son Michael, she worked as a secretary in a bank and had been promoted to executive secretary, the highest position available to women in the banking industry at that time. However, Mrs. Graham had one major problem. She was not a particularly good typist and had to spend long hours retyping documents on new pieces of paper. Mrs. Graham wasn't the only secretary who was continually frustrated at having to completely retype documents due to simple typographical mistakes, and it wasn't long before she realised that her biggest problem was, in fact, her greatest opportunity. It came to her one night as she was walking home from work. She noticed billboard painters painting over their mistakes. And that was the moment the idea came to her. She reasoned to herself, if those artists can paint over their mistakes, why can't typists? The benefits were obvious. If there was a way to enable a typist to paint over their typing errors, businesses would be able to make huge savings not only by greatly reducing the amount of wasted paper, but also, and more importantly, their secretarial staff would save an enormous amount of time that they were having to spend retyping entire documents due to small typing errors. Mrs. Graham's solution was to mix some water-based tempera paint in her blender so it would match the colour of the paper she was using. Then, using a small paintbrush, she was able to simply paint over typing errors, 
leave the paper to dry, and then retype over the paint. She tried out the mixture at work, and her boss never noticed. However, there was one small issue with the mixture. It took a long time to dry. She consulted a high school science teacher and a supply company for help in changing the mixture, which she originally called Mistake Out, so that it became a quick drying solution. It wasn't long before other secretaries noticed and begged Mrs. Graham for some of her solution. As it gained popularity, orders poured in, and she used her son and his friends to help her label and fill little green bottles with her solution. However, she was soon to face another problem. She was fired by the bank for using its stationery to promote her liquid paper. That problem, like her original one, also contained an opportunity, because it meant she could now devote all of her time to marketing and selling her invention. Business soared, and Mrs. Graham went on to buy her own small factory, hire staff, and install machinery to automate production. In 1975, Bette Nesmith Graham decided to sell the rights to her invention to the Gillette Company. The problem that Mrs. Graham had struggled with at work 22 years earlier had transformed her life and turned into a cash payout of $25 million. Looking for opportunities Innovation is the specific tool of entrepreneurs, the means by which they exploit change as an opportunity. Peter F. Drucker The exact same problem that faced Sylvan Goldman in 1936 confronted thousands of other supermarket owners throughout the world at the time. What enabled Goldman to find an opportunity that thousands of others missed? Likewise, Virtually every secretary in the Western world in 1946 was frustrated by the same problem that frustrated Bette Nesmith Graham. Yet, despite having no obvious advantages, Mrs. Graham found an opportunity that no one else saw. And of course, Louis Braille was just one of thousands of other blind children having to make their way in a sighted world. And even though he was just a teenager, he developed a system that enabled blind people to read and write. The problems that we all face, more often than not, are the same problems that other people face or have faced, and the opportunities that are hidden within each problem are there for everyone to find. That Sylvan Goldman, Louis Braille and Bet Graham were able to achieve what they did was due in no small part to the fact that they approached their problems with a specific mindset. It is a mindset which is no longer spoken of in some schools, where fear of failure and rejection has brought about policies of non-competition. And it is a mindset that is scorned and increasingly ignored by people in the blame-and-compensate culture in which we live. But it is a mindset without which we can never find the flip side. It is the mindset of an entrepreneur. Ted Turner once quipped, My son is now an entrepreneur. That's what you're called when you don't have a job. He is right, of course. Most entrepreneurs do not have jobs. More often than not, they create jobs, but they don't have jobs. Because the entrepreneur mindset is completely different to an employee mindset. Entrepreneurs like to be in control of their destiny, and they accept responsibility for their future. They are the visionaries and dreamers who, just like inventors, can change the world. When Martin Varsavsky was about to graduate from Columbia University with an MBA in 1984, he was, unlike many of his peers, still without a job. Looking back, he believes that his fruitless job search was the best thing that ever happened to him. And reviewing a CV, it would be hard to disagree. In the 20 years following his graduation, Varsavsky founded seven highly profitable companies, and received various honours and rewards, among them European Telecommunications Entrepreneur of the Year in 1998, Ector's European Entrepreneur of the Year in 1999, Global Leader for Tomorrow, 
by the World Economic Forum and Davos 2000, Spanish Entrepreneur of the Year in 2000, and the Pickering Prize from Columbia University in 2004. Varsavsky is also an entertaining and a reverent speaker. He likes to recall how he received the funding for his first venture. At the same time as one bank was rejecting his application for a job, a different department in the same bank was approving him for a $12 million business loan. People on the hiring committee didn't know that there was another group at that time who was actually looking at my loan application for my first business, said Vasavsky, and the same people who wouldn't give me a $40,000 a year job gave me a $12 million loan. Fortunately, they never found out, because these banks are really big and nobody ever talks to each other. Receiving rejections on his job applications never really worried Martin Vasavsky. When asked at each interview, Where do you see yourself in five years? He gave the same reply. Well, as your boss. But the reason that he never feared repeated rejection was that he always had the mindset of an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs, many times, like myself, he said, are people who couldn't get a job. We're misfits. We hate jobs, he said. The one thing that distinguishes them from everyone else is that entrepreneurs live their lives on the flip side. They look for opportunities in everything. When NBC cancelled a TV series called Baywatch after only one season due to the high costs of production and low ratings, David Hasselhoff, one of the show's stars, saw an opportunity. The show revolved around a team of lifeguards who patrol the beaches in Los Angeles, California, and Hasselhoff instinctively felt that the show had huge potential. He revived the show, investing his own money and proceeded to syndicate the first series. The second series proved Hasselhoff's instincts had been right. The show went on to run for a further ten years, and according to the Guinness Book of Records, Baywatch became the most watched TV show of all time, topping over a billion viewers. David Hasselhoff is commonly known for his acting and, in some European countries, for his music. Other than his success in Baywatch, he starred in Knight Rider. In a show that ran on NBC from 1982 to 1986, Hasselhoff played a character called Michael Knight, a high-tech modern-day knight fighting crime with the help of a sentient talking car that had artificial intelligence. However, what many people don't often realise is that David Hasselhoff is an extremely successful entrepreneur. One man, more than any other, changed the entertainment industry in America in the 20th century. He has been referred to as the most significant figure in graphic arts since Leonardo da Vinci, and he received more than 950 honours and awards in his lifetime from countries all over the world, including 26 Oscars, a record that stands to this day. Yet his success was the product not so much of his artistic skills, the drawing for which he is most famous was not his creation, but more the product of his entrepreneurial skills, or more specifically, his ability to turn any setback into a new opportunity. His name was Walt Disney. As you enter the gates of the Magic Kingdom, Disneyland, Florida, the first thing you see is a bronze statue of Walt Disney, a friendly man with slicked back hair and a trim moustache holding hands with Mickey Mouse. Certainly, it was that lovable mouse that was responsible for launching Disney's successful enterprise in cartoon picture movies. However, Mickey Mouse was actually created by one of Disney's oldest friends and former partners, Oob Iwerks. That Mickey Mouse was created at all was due to a contractual problem involving Disney, Winkler Pictures and Universal Studios. In 1927, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, a cartoon character also created by Iwerks, had enjoyed a successful run in theatres. 
Charles Mintz, took control of Winkler Pictures after marrying Margaret Winkler and commissioned a new series for the character Oswald. However, when Disney went to negotiate a higher fee, he discovered that Mintz was unaccommodating. It transpired that behind Disney's back, Mintz had hired most of Disney's staff. He had learned that it was Universal and not Disney that owned the rights to the Oswald character, and Mintz had Disney over a barrel. He demanded Disney go on his payroll and accept a lower fee, or he would get the pictures produced himself. Disney was furious, but would not be bullied. The setback taught him perhaps the most important lesson of his career. He would always control the rights of all the cartoon characters he commissioned. He decided that the loss of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was an opportunity to create something new, and asked Iwax to come up with an alternative cartoon character. After a string of ideas including Clarabelle Cow and Horace Horse, as well as frogs, dogs and cats, Iwax came up with the idea of Mickey Mouse, and on the 18th of November 1928, the first Mickey Mouse animated film, Steamboat Willie, was produced. The first few Mickey Mouse adventures were animated almost entirely by Iwerks. But then he and Disney parted company. Iwerks was reportedly unhappy with Disney's harsh work demands and the lack of credit he was being given. However, Disney owned the rights to Mickey Mouse and brought in a team of young, talented artists to help him develop what has become the most well-known cartoon character of all time recognized by children and adults all over the world. From Mickey Mouse, Walt Disney changed the entertainment industry in North America and arguably throughout most of the world. Today, the Walt Disney Company has annual revenues in excess of $35 billion, larger than the gross domestic product of many countries. Yet, it was all triggered by a setback, the Disney turned into an opportunity. Coffee Burns Claire Newton was one of thousands of commuters heading to work when it happened. She was a 42-year-old packaging designer from Hackney, East London, and had just stopped off to purchase a takeaway cup of cappuccino. Struggling to carry her bag and a hot drink, she slipped and burned her arm all the way to her elbow. It was an accident that would change her life. Claire could have considered suing the outlet that sold the cappuccino to her. She certainly wouldn't have been the first to seek compensation after spilling a cup of hot coffee. But instead of feeling sorry for herself or consulting a personal injury lawyer, Claire did something that is common to virtually every person who has achieved lasting happiness and success in life. She looked for the flip side. After her accident, as she was waiting with an ice pack against her skin, Claire became aware of something that none of the thousands of other people who had ever suffered burns while carrying a hot takeaway coffee had noticed. The accident had presented a huge and very exciting opportunity. Claire explains that while she had been nursing her injury, it occurred to her that many people buy coffee when they're laden down with bags and risk burning themselves, I decided to find a solution. She began thinking of ways to minimize that risk and set about creating a product that would make it easier and safer for people to carry a hot drink even when they were carrying other baggage. Claire came up with a simple yet brilliant design called Cups Carrier, which allows a user to hold a cup in three different ways, via a handle, at the side, or the top, or by forming a cradle to support the cup, which also acts as a desk stand for it. I remember one day, I went to a meeting and my client's jaws dropped open when they saw the cup carrier, Claire says. I was loaded down with my portfolio, briefcase, umbrella and handbag, but had the two coffees balanced just on the end of my little finger in the double carrier. They were amazed. Claire registered her design which went on to win her the British Female Inventor of the Year Award in 2001, an award supported by the British Patent Office. 
The key to Claire's success lay in her understanding that her accident exposed a need for an easy and safe way to carry hot takeaway coffee while carrying other things on the way to work. By focusing on that need and looking for solutions, Claire was able to find the flip side. Entrepreneurs cultivate the habit of always looking for opportunities. Whenever there is change, whenever they notice a problem or an obstacle, they get excited rather than frustrated because they know that problems and obstacles expose needs. Entrepreneurs understand that the single most critical factor that will predict the success of any business is the size of the problem it aims to solve or the significance of the need it seeks to fulfill. For any business to be successful, it needs to be able to offer a solution to a problem and thereby fulfill a need. Thomas Edison, widely acknowledged as one of the greatest inventors in history, based his entire career upon this premise. He explained, I never perfected an invention that I did not think about in terms of the service it might give others. I find out what the world needs, then I proceed to invent. The flip side of any problem or obstacle, therefore, lies in the need that it exposes. Big problems or obstacles tend to reveal big needs, and they contain big flip sides. This is why entrepreneurs like Sylvan Goldman welcome problems, and why inventors like Thomas Edison will actually go out of their way to find problems. A problem to them is actually an opportunity in disguise. The Entrepreneur Within Michael Gerber author of the best-selling book The E-Myth, believes that there is an entrepreneur which he defines as a visionary and a creator in each of us. We're all born with that quality, he says, and it defines our lives as we respond to what we see, hear, feel and experience. That entrepreneurial spirit within us needs to be nurtured and developed, because it determines how we react to life experiences and, ultimately, our success and happiness in life. While we all may have the ability to think and act as an entrepreneur, all too often we don't. One of the reasons might be that at some point in the past we learned to be helpless. Another might be that in times of difficulty we simply don't look for opportunities. Of course, this does not refer solely to opportunities to make monetary gain, but to the broader and more significant opportunities such as to learn, to understand, to love, to fulfill one's potential, and to make a difference. More often than not, it takes the mindset of an entrepreneur to find the opportunities that remain hidden to everyone else. To develop that mindset requires that we ask different questions of ourselves, especially in times of difficulty. But if we can ask the right questions, questions that reframe a problem or setback, the answers will point us in the direction of the flip side. Chapter 10 Reframing Your Life The Critical Questions In the final analysis, the questions of why bad things happen to good people transmutes itself into some very different questions, no longer asking why something happened, but asking how we will respond and what we intend to do now that it has happened. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin When Jody Plischke lost all her hair, she was just 20 years old. She is a good-looking, outgoing and vivacious woman today, a little more than 20 years on. However, she admits that when her hair fell out, leaving her completely bald, she was absolutely devastated. Alopecia areata affects nearly one in every 60 women at some point in their lives, and of those, almost two-thirds are affected while they are still in their teens. Clumps of hair just fall away from the scalp, leaving a smooth, bald patch. It is thought to be the result of a malfunctioning immune system. For some reason, 
The white blood cells target hair much like a virus and cause it to fall out. Alopecia can come in a number of forms. Sometimes only small areas of the hair on the scalp are affected. But in other cases, every hair on the body falls away. This is the type of alopecia that Jody had and is known as alopecia universalis. All her body hair, including the eyebrows, eyelashes, even nasal hair, was lost. As you can imagine, alopecia is a terrible trauma for any woman, young or old, to suffer. The moment of realization when one's hair starts falling out and knowing that it may never grow back is not something anyone would forget in a hurry. From that moment, life may never be the same. It can feel to the sufferer that their life has been cursed, but like any trauma, it could end up being a blessing. The flip side of alopecia. When Jody Plischka lost her hair through alopecia universalis, she was 20 years old. Jody is an attractive lady with a wide, beaming smile and large, sparkling eyes. But she had no aspirations to be a model. Instead, she became a therapist and a volunteer for alopecia support groups, as well as cancer societies. I found that sharing my experiences in life were always very cathartic, she said. Each time I open up myself, I strengthen myself. However, it was through her daily activities that Jody found the biggest flip side to her alopecia. I'm a huge fitness lover, she said, and work out every morning except Sundays. She runs, cycles, and likes to do short triathlons. She also regularly trains in the martial art Taekwondo, along with her daughter Jessica. Jody has achieved black belt status and her daughter is currently a blue belt. They enjoy going to the dojo and training together. And it was while training that Jody had an idea that would mark a change of life for her, as well as for thousands of other people. It was an idea born of a sudden realization that would perhaps only be obvious to someone like Jody who had to wear a wig. I wear my wig while doing Taekwondo, Jody says, because I like to try and fit in when I am with Jessica. But it was while wearing a wig when she trained that Jody exposed a real problem and a huge opportunity. I got so tired of sweat saturating my wigs and then running into my eyes, she explains. The more she thought about it, the more she realized that it was a problem that must affect thousands of men and women. So Jody set out to find a solution and design a product that could help. Initially, she put panty liners under her wigs to catch the perspiration, and although she thought it was a little undignified, it worked. So, Jody spent the following three years developing a product that would do the same job, but also be more discreet and better suited for people who had to wear wigs. Jody called her invention Headline It, and explained that it would help not just alopecia sufferers, but literally anyone who had to wear a wig, hat, or baseball cap. In 2006, she entered Headline It on the TV show American Inventor and beat thousands of other people to reach the final 12. Her presentation to the panel of judges was more of an impassioned plea than a product pitch because Jody knew only too well what a difference Headline It could make not only to alopecia sufferers, but also to cancer patients, and anyone who, for whatever reason, had to wear a wig. The publicity from the show gave her a platform for her invention, which has gone from being an idea to a real product that has the potential to make a real difference in so many people's lives all over the world. In addition, Jody's appearance on American Inventor raised the profile of her other work, and perhaps, most important of all, it created awareness of the plight of people who suffer from alopecia. Looking back on her life since the condition struck, she says, I lost my hair, and God has taken me on a journey to become a therapist, author, inventor, and spokesperson. She said that she now knows 
that trials create a person's inner being, we have the choice to either be a survivor or a victim. I am a survivor. In the last paragraph of her book, Jody Plishka writes, Perhaps losing my hair wasn't the horror I once felt it to be. There is no greater gift than in knowing our purpose in life. This is one of the most significant changes that alopecia brought to Jody's life. A renewed faith and a feeling of purpose. I lived with my hair for 20 years, she says. I lived without hair for 20 more. And I am happy with the distances I have come in my 40 years. The motto that she espouses is a plea to anyone who has lost their hair, whether through alopecia, cancer or any other condition. There is life after hair loss. Jody's motto underlines an important message. There is truly life after all illusions break down, she says. Life after all the fallout of our own misbelief. Life after all the pieces have been shattered, after all the threads have come undone. It is a message to anyone who has faced any trauma or setback. There is life. After anything that may happen to us, and all that we may encounter, there is life. Fate, Karma, and God Jody Plishka admits that when her hair initially fell out, her anguish and fear bordered on hysteria. I cried, I screamed, she recalls. I railed against God then demanded to know, why me? But as she came to terms with her condition, Jody found that she was asking different questions, the answers to which led her down new and unexpected paths. Whenever disaster strikes, the first question we tend to ask is, why me, or what did I do to deserve this? Some people would have you believe that we bring about our own crises, you attracted it in some way, through your thoughts or negative energy, or it is the natural outcome of your karma, the result of something you did or said in the past, or even, according to Hinduism, something that may have happened during a past life. Some are certain that a personal tragedy is divine punishment for our sins, and there are others who believe a trauma is a test from God. If the book of Job is to be believed, God allows tragedies as part of a wager to test our love and devotion to him. As with any theological question, there is no rational answer, which is why the final reply given by a priest or rabbi to the difficult question such as, why does God permit evil and suffering, is, we cannot understand why some things happen as they do, because God moves in mysterious ways. However, whatever our religious beliefs, we cannot escape from the fact that if we expect a world of order, a world of fairness and justice, there will be times when we will be disappointed. Sometimes it appears that we are trapped in a life of chaos, surrounded by random happenings that are unfair and unjust. I believe that there are answers, and those answers are found on the flip side. To find them, we need to ask very different questions. The Critical Questions In part one, we learned that very little in life is inherently good or bad. Winning the lottery can lead to wretchedness and even death, whereas losing one's business or livelihood can turn out to be the making of a person. What ultimately makes something that happens to us a blessing or a curse is often not the event itself, but how we respond to that event. One thing is certain. We are very unlikely to be able to turn any sort of setback into an opportunity, asking futile questions that bring nothing but anguish, like, why me? The human brain will search and find an answer for any question we ask about any event in our lives. For example, if we ask, why did this happen to me, our brain will start to come up with a variety of possible answers. Because you're clumsy, 
because you're stupid, because you're cursed, because nothing ever works out for you. Our brains will come up with plenty of possible answers to explain whatever predicament in which we find ourselves. But what would happen if we trained ourselves to reframe any setbacks by asking different questions? How might our lives change if we got into the habit of asking questions like, what is good about this? Or, what could be good about this? Or, what can I learn from this that will benefit me as a person? Or, what can I learn from this that will benefit other people? Or, what can I do right now to turn this to my advantage? Blue Focus To solve the problems of today, we must focus on tomorrow. Eric Nupanen A woman sits at a desk. Her eyes are welling up to the point where she can no longer hold back her tears. A man puts his arm around her to comfort her in her time of grief. One by one, people gather around the woman, offering their sympathy and support. For a moment, she is inconsolable. She has just lost 223,000 pounds. To be more accurate, she had actually won 27,000 pounds, but in her mind, she had lost 223,000. She was on the TV show Deal or No Deal, and her plight was witnessed by millions of TV viewers. What had actually happened was that she'd opened her box at the end of the game to find that she would have won £250,000, but she had chosen to deal earlier in the game and accepted an offer of 27000 One would think that if someone is handed a cheque for £27,000, they would be delirious with excitement. But the truth is, our emotions are not determined by what happens to us. They are purely the result of what we focus on. One of the characteristics shared by people who have found the flip side is that they have learned how to develop something called blue focus. Wherever you are sitting, try this simple exercise. 1. Take a good look all around you and try and notice everything that is brown. Really try and memorize everything you see that is brown, whether it be dark or light brown. 2. In a moment, without peeking, close your eyes and try and remember everything you saw that was blue. Most people are stumped. They are so focused on the brown things that they hardly notice anything that is blue. It is a reflection of what many of us have experienced in our lives at one time or another. Someone shows us a particular type of car or computer and then we begin to see it everywhere we go. It was there all the time, but we only noticed it when our mind was focused on it. Similarly, we sometimes allow ourselves to get so focused on the negative things in our lives, the brown, that we don't notice any of the positive things, the blue. The lady who won £27,000 on Deal or No Deal is a prime example. She was focused on the fact that she had lost an opportunity to win £250,000 instead of the fact that she had won 27000 People who are able to turn adversity to their advantage practice blue focus. When faced with difficulties and through times of change, they consciously look for the blue things in their lives. Blue focus means to never look backward, except insofar as one can learn a lesson. It means to always concentrate on looking forward, People with blue focus never dwell on what may have been lost, only on what can be gained. They never think about limitations, only the possibilities. In every experience, they are always looking to reframe the situation and actively seek benefits. The Art of Reframing The meaning of any experience in life depends upon our interpretation of it, or, as NLP practitioners say, 
the frame we put around it. Whatever happens to us, we can choose the frame. We can decide to give it a positive meaning. For example, when someone loses a job, they could frame it as a negative reflection of their ability or personality, proof that they failed. They may even convince themselves that they'll never be able to find another job, and if they do, that it will never be as good as the one they lost. Or they could reframe it as an opportunity for them to do something different, something new and exciting. Some might think it an opportunity to start their own business. Some people seem to have a knack of reframing situations. Comedians, writers, inventors, and politicians are just a few of the professions that require people to constantly reframe events. The best comedians, for example, are astute observers of life and are constantly asking themselves, "What's funny about this?" or "What could be funny about this?" In the early 1970s, during the filming of the TV series Monty Python's Flying Circus, John Cleese. Together with other members of the Monty Python team, checked into the Hotel Glen Eagles in Torquay. The hotel manager, a man by the name of Donald Sinclair, turned out to be quite a rude, eccentric host. He seemed to view us as a colossal inconvenience right from the start," said Michael Palin. He threw a bus timetable at a guest when the guest dared to ask the time of the next bus. He complained about Terry Gilliam's table manners and tossed Eric Idle's briefcase out of the hotel in case it contained a time bomb. John Cleese made mental notes and used the whole experience to write the hit TV comedy Forty Towers. Similarly, Only Fools and Horses creator John Sullivan used a lot of real-life incidents in his storylines. One of the funniest scenes was in an episode from the second series called A Touch of Glass. The chandelier scene. The scene was based upon a story Sullivan's father had told him of the days when he worked as a plumber in the 1930s. Sullivan's father was part of a crew who were fitting a new heating system into a stately home. In order to lay the new pipes, they had to move some chandeliers. While some of the men were standing under one chandelier, ready to catch it in a sheet, one of their colleagues was loosening a different chandelier. Which fell to the ground and smashed to pieces. When Sullivan's father told him the story, it was told as a serious tale, because a number of the men he was working with were given the sack that day. But Sullivan immediately saw a comic side, and an entire episode was written around that one scene. When police in Manhattan pulled over a car being driven by a young man with wild Afro-styled hair, they were not aware. That the man in question was Malcolm Gladwell, best-selling author of *The Tipping Point* and *Blink*. The police had been on the lookout for a rapist, and the police said Gladwell fitted the description. They interrogated Gladwell for about twenty minutes before finally agreeing to let him go. It turned out that when they checked the actual description of the rapist, the man they were looking for was taller, broader, and about fifteen years younger than Gladwell. All we had in common," said Gladwell, "was a large head of curly hair. It was just the kind of thoughtless stop and search occurrence that can create an added strain on police community relations. However, Gladwell did not get riled. He became thoughtful, wondering how the policeman could have mistaken him for the actual rapist, when there were so many obvious discrepancies in the description of the man they were looking for. He thought about the strange power of first impressions, and this led him to research and write the book *Blink*. In the acknowledgement section of the book, the people Gladwell thanks first, albeit tongue in cheek, are the policemen, who stopped him in his car and wasted half an hour of his day, because it was that incident that triggered his thoughts and ultimately led to him writing his new book. Gladwell acknowledged that. Had he not been pulled over that day, it is unlikely that the book would ever have been written. Looking for benefits. Maeve Binchy is one of the world's best-selling authors, whose work includes *Circle of Friends*, which was made into a Hollywood film.
In 2002, Maeve suffered heart failure that required her to be hospitalized for 10 days, and she's been on medication ever since. She said in an interview with the Daily Mail that, Before it happened, if you'd have asked me how life would have been after something like this, I'd have told you it would inevitably have been a wretched, curtailed experience. But in actual fact, she said her life since the illness was diagnosed had been the very opposite. Maeve got involved in learning about her condition, the medical treatments and dietary factors. She cut out salt, became sparing in her use of butter, and cut back on alcohol. But she's also a great believer in a positive attitude, which she says was the key. In fact, far from leading a wretched existence, Maeve believes she's happier now than she has ever been. And her latest novel, Heart and Soul, was inspired by the conversations she listened in on while sitting in hospital waiting rooms. Interestingly, Maeve Binchy is also an optimist. She has a very positive approach to life. I have no wish to live a restricted nervous life, she said. If you woke up each morning and immediately dwelt on your ills, what sort of day could you look forward to? The secret of reframing is similar to the entrepreneur's habit of consciously looking for opportunities only when you reframe a situation, you are looking for benefits rather than opportunities. The one critical question that positive reframers ask themselves when facing any difficult situation is what is good about this or what could be good about this? Through these questions, the situation is seen in a different light. And as a result, people will generally experience different outcomes. Looking for benefits in a stressful situation is, as you might expect, a trait common to optimists. Studies have shown that people who actively look for benefits when diagnosed with serious illnesses, such as cancer, tend to cope better, suffer less emotional distress, and experience a superior quality of life. Interestingly, it is not something that necessarily happens after the passage of time. In many cases, people look for benefits in a trauma or illness very early on. Sometimes it could be critical, because the earlier people start looking for benefits, the sooner they find them. This ends Disc 4.